there are a lot of interesting applications for optimization. This is one of the more classic types of problems, but the thinking involved in, in building and solving this type of problem is important. So if we can reason through a problem like this and we can solve it, then that opens up the doors to many other types of problems that we can, we can solve. So first of all, we have to get, get our minds around modeling and building an equation. And then only at that time can we then use our calculus techniques to solve the problem. So suppose you're designing a new soda can that has the lowest possible materials costs. The can is to be cylindrical and to have a volume of 21.7 cubic inches. Uh, now this is about 12 fluid ounces, the size of your standard uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi can. And we're going to deal with cubic inches because uh, we're going to be measuring the radius of a can and the height of a can and it's, it, it, fluid ounces is not conducive to doing that. The sides of the can are thin and cost one cent per square inch of aluminum. The bottom is thicker and costs two cents per square inch of aluminum. The top requires a tab and is the most costly at three cents per cubic square inch of aluminum. What should the diameter and height of this new can be? So first of all, let's think about our, our, our can here. And what we're saying is that if, if, if we look at the sides, the sides of the can, the sides of the can it corresponds to this portion here. So if I were to take one square inch of this can, and this was to be one inch by one inch, then the cost of this is going to be one cent. Now the question is, how many of those square inches am I going to have to surround the can in order to do what? Well, we want the lowest possible materials costs. Okay, so what we want to do here is our objective is to minimize, minimize cost. Okay, well, let's think about the can and its construction first. So a can, if you were to take this and you were to uh, remove, remove the top and remove the bottom, and you were to cut it down lengthwise like this, and you were to unravel it, what you would get is a sheet of aluminum. So imagine that we, that we basically take this and we unravel it. So you can kind of imagine it to separate somewhat like this. I'm not a, a fantastic artist here, but imagine that this is, this is where our cut line was. And then we sort of take this right here and we unravel it going this way. All right, so this is all the aluminum that we're gonna need for the sides. Now, to understand how that's gonna work, we first of all have to create some labels here. So what is it that we're trying to determine? The diameter and the height of this new can. Now, typically we don't deal with diameter when we're using, working in geometry. A lot of times we deal with radius. So this can is gonna have a certain radius and the, the radius of the can is gonna be the distance from the center of the can to the outer edge. So this is going to be some radius R, which is going to be measured in inches. Since our volume is in cubic inches, we want to measure everything in inches. We want to stay in the same unit. Otherwise, we have to convert all the inches to, let's say, feet. But why would we be working in feet in the first place? And then also we have this distance here, which is the height of the can. And we'll denote that by H, which will also be in inches. Now our cost, if we think about how we're going to begin constructing this, our cost is going to be a function of the radius and the height. Those are the two things that are going to affect how much material we need. Now I'm just going to write this out in, in words, first of all. So we're going to have the, the total cost function is going to be the cost of the sides, or I should say of, of the side, and we're going to add to that the cost of the bottom and add to that the cost of the top. So those are the three things that are going to influence how much it's going to cost us to construct one of these cans. So to get the cost of the sides, we know that that's going to be one cent or 0 0.01 times, that's, that's per square inch, that's dollars per square inch multiplied by the uh, area of the side, right? So that's gonna be the area 
of this region, area of the side. So again, this is the this is the side, but it's we cut the can down the center and we we basically get a rectangle when we pull that can apart and flatten it out. So this is going to be times the area of the side. And you can see that what I'm really doing here is I'm I'm trying to build as much as I can without getting into some of the unknowns. So I don't know how to do this quite yet. But I do know that to get the cost of the sides, I have to multiply how much it costs per square inch times the number of square inches involved in computing the area of the side. Uh, plus, I'm going to need the cost of the bottom. And the cost of the bottom is, we know, two cents per square inch of aluminum. Two cents per square inch of the aluminum multiplied by the area of the bottom multiplied by the area of the bottom. Now, the area of the bottom and the top, the, the bottom is circular and so is the bottom. I'm so, sorry, the bottom is circular and so is the top. And now the same kind of idea here for the cost of the top, it's going to be the, the cost per square inch, three cents per square inch, multiplied by the area of the top. Now, the areas are all going to be functions of the, the radius and the height, which I don't know yet. That's what I'm trying to figure out. What, what is going to be the value of the radius and the height? Okay, so let's think about our area of the side first. So, first of all, the total height is this component here. This is our height. Right? This is basically the distance from the top of the can to the bottom of the can. The question is, how long is this piece of aluminum going to be when we unfold it? Well, the distance around the can is exactly the circumference of that, of that can, right? Of, of the circle corresponding to the top and the bottom. They're both going to be the exact same circle. So I have to think about what do I know about cylinders? So cylinders, and I could look this up, I could just do a quick search. The volume of a cylinder, the volume of a cylinder is going to be pi r squared times the height. Pi times r squared times the height. The, uh, for a circle, well, I can't talk about the volume of a circle. A circle is a two-dimensional object. So the area of a circle is going to be pi r squared. So the, the relationship between the volume of a cylinder and the area of a circle, you notice that there's just a factor of h here. So if you think about how we compute the volume of a cylinder, well, it's the area of the top multiplied by basically how many, if we were to stack a bunch of circles together, we were to smash them and compress them, we would get exactly a cylinder. So that's why we intuitively multiply by height. So these are two formulas that we could look up. And so that we know that the area of the top the area of the top and the bottom. So here's the circle. And the we know that the this has a radius of r. And same thing with the bottom. The bottom is exactly the same circle. And that has a radius of r. So both of these will have areas that are the areas of circles. So this will be pi r squared. And the area of the bottom will also be pi r squared. Okay, the circumference of a circle, the circumference, which is the distance all the way around the circle, is 2 pi r. 2 pi r. So that means that since each of these tops and bottoms have a radius of r, the circumference, or the distance around the entire circle, which it corresponds to the length of aluminum that we'll have here, this is going to be 2 pi r units long. So that means the area of the side, now we see that this is a rectangle whenever you unfold that sheet of aluminum, it's curled up into, into a cylinder, it's going to be the length by the width, so it'll be 2 pi r times h. So this will be equal to 0 0.01 times the area of the side, which we just said was 2 pi r h plus 2 cents 
for every square inch of the bottom multiplied by the area of the bottom. How many square inches are in that bottom? Well, there's pi r squared of them. So this will be pi r squared. And then plus 3 cents times the area of the top, which is, again, pi r squared square inches. Each of these units is square inches because we're talking about area. And now we have our cost function. We have that the cost as a function of radius and height is equal to this equation here. Now, all of these three terms are positive. There's a, there's a, a plus sign in front of the first term. That's going to be a positive number. The area, the cost of the bottom is going to be a positive number, and the cost of the top is going to be a positive number. So if I asked you to minimize this cost function just the way it is, the radius and height that we would get would be zero. Well, that's because every unit of radius is going to cost you money. The bigger the radius you make it relative to zero, it's going to cost you money. And same thing with the height. As the height increases, it's going to cost you money. So if we were to try to minimize this cost, we would get zero as it stands. But we have a restriction here. We're saying that the volume, the volume has to be 21.7 cubic inches. So the volume, which is related to this formula here, the volume of that cylinder. So what I'm going to do is replace volume with 21.7. So I have 21.7 equals pi r squared h. Now, this gives me a relationship between the radius and the height. You may not see it immediately, but if I divide both sides by pi r squared, pi r squared, then I get that h, the height, has to be 21.7 over pi times the radius squared. Well, what I'm going to do with this now is this is going to help me take this function here, and what we're going to do is we're going to replace h with this quantity. So all we're doing is we're imposing this restriction. Oops, there's only going to be one place where that h gets plugged in, and that's going to be here. So what I'm effectively doing is saying that my cost as a function of the radius and the height is equal to 0 0.01 times 2 pi r times the height, which is now 21.7 over pi r squared. And now it's plus my other two terms, which are only functions of r. All right, and um, so now over in this first term, I can see that the pi and one of the r's will cancel out. So this will leave me with just r to the first power. And now when we multiply the constants 0.01 times 2 times 2.17, 0.01 times 20, 21.7 is 0.217, and if we double that, we get uh, 0.434, so that's this times this times this, divided by r. Now these two can be added together right here. They are both pi r squared terms, and that's going to give me plus 0 0.05 pi r squared. Great, now we have our function for the total cost in terms of, now it's just in terms of the radius, but I'm gonna treat this problem exactly the same way even though it doesn't involve an H. So using Wolfram Alpha, we can compute the two partial derivatives, C sub R of R comma H, and set it equal to zero, C sub H of R comma H, and set it equal to zero. I'm going to omit the screen and, and finding these partial derivatives, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what they are. So this one will lead to negative 0.434 over r squared, and then the second one will give me plus 0.1 pi times r, and we're going to set that equal to zero. Now, the derivative with respect to h, this equation doesn't depend on h, so not, not surprisingly, we're going to get zero equals zero. Now, that's not a very useful equation because zero is always going to equal zero regardless of what the value of r or h is. So when I enter this into Wolfram Alpha, I'm only going to worry about entering the top equation in. So let's go ahead and do that. So here I have that equation entered in, negative 4.34 over x squared 
plus 0 0.1 times pi times x equals 0. To get the pi symbol, you can either type it in, just type in pi, or you can use the extended keyboard and get the pi symbol there. It'll give you the same answer. I just like spelling it out so I don't have to keep clicking all over the screen. Now I scroll down to find where the solution is, and it tells me that the real solution is about 1.11. Okay, now I used, I used x here. Um, I just chose to use x, but if you use r, should give you the same answer. Let's just double check using R in there. See, you just have to make sure that it's, you read carefully. It says, assuming R is a variable, use R squared as a unit instead. I don't know what the unit R squared is, but um, we wanna make sure R is a variable. So that looks good. And then it tells me that R is about 1.11. Okay, so we get out of this equation, we get that R is about 1.11 inches. Well, how do we get H? Well, the good news is that we have the relationship between height and radius here. And so now when we compute the, the, the height, the height is equal to 21.7 over pi times the radius squared. So the radius is 1.11 and we square that, and we get about 5.61 inches of height. So what we've concluded is that the can that we should be using is about 5.61 inches tall, and it has a radius of 1.11 inches. So this distance here is R is about 1.11 inches. And this seems roughly about what we would expect out of a soda can. We could now compute what the minimum cost is, but since the question just asked us, what are the dimensions of the optimal can? We have um, at this point minimized the cost. Now the, the D test, unfortunately in this situation, and primarily because the second or the, the partial derivative with respect to h is zero, the d-test is going to report a value of zero. And what a d-test value of zero means is that the test itself is inconclusive. So we get d equals zero, d would be equal to zero. I'm going to skip that, but if you compute the second partial derivative of this, you do c sub r r at the radius, which is 1.11 height of 5.61 times C sub H H of 1.11 and 5.61 minus the square of C sub R H at 1.11, 5.61, and you square that, you're gonna get D equals zero. So the test, D test is inconclusive. So what do we do in situations like this? Well, the good news is that one, one thing that we can do here is just look at the cost for a different radius, one that's smaller and one that's larger than 1.11 inches, and just see that this actually, this dimension actually produces the minimum cost in this function. So to verify, to verify min with d-test failure in, or inconclusiveness, uh, we, could, we could compute the cost of our current dimensions, 1.11 and 5.61. And then we could uh, look at a radius that is smaller and larger than 1.11. So let's pick, let's pick something like C of 1. And it really doesn't matter what the height is for this can. We don't have to go back and recompute it because our cost is written only in terms of R. So this would be 0.434 over one times 0 0.05 plus 0 0.05 times pi times one squared. And the cost of a can with a one inch radius will be 59 cents. The cost of a can with 1.11 inches of radius is gonna be 58 cents. So that's cheaper than using a smaller radius. And if we look at a can that has a, a radius of two, which is a radius slightly bigger than our current radius, we see that it costs significantly more. So we can confirm, in fact, that this 
situation right here represents a minimum cost. And that's a way to verify if the d-test fails. You can, you can pick a neighboring point, one on the left, one on the right, just to confirm that you found a maximum or a minimum, because we never want to actually find the most expensive can. We want to make sure that we're finding the cheapest can. 